open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Welcome to 3ABN Australia Homecoming. Hello, my name's John Malkovich, and if you've joined us from somewhere in Australia, New Zealand, somewhere in the South Pacific, in fact, anywhere from around the world, I want to give you a special and warm welcome to our 3AB in Australia Homecoming 2022. Time certainly flies. Our theme is Open My Eyes, and it's actually found in a text in the Bible from Psalms 119, and verse 18, it says, Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things out of our law. Each speaker is presenting from the word of God truths that are very essential for salvation and to know God as our saviour. He is full of passion, grace and kindness to each one of us. And we're going to be listening to another program today. But before we go there, our previous program was taken by Pastor Justin Tarosian. And he's an interesting fellow and his history or his family history goes back to the times of Alan White. His subject that he spoke on the, in the last program was called The Eternal Law of God. And I've summarised it under three points that maybe if you didn't see it that you would be encouraged to go and watch it. First point is God's law goes far beyond the written word or the Ten Commandments. It's synonymous with his character and is as eternal as God himself. The second point, he desires to write his law on our hearts and for us to memorise these things from the Bible. The third one is through having his word in our hearts, it enables his spirit to give us victory, blending our characters with the character of Jesus and preparing us for eternity with him. What a wonderful thought. I would like to be there. I'm sure you would. Our speaker today is Pastor Mike Browning, and many of you would know him because he's, he's been on 3ABN many times. And he's speaking, Jesus, the light of the world. You know what? I think about open my eyes. We really need to see the light of the world, and that's Jesus. But before he speaks, we have Kevin and Jenny Petrie, and they're singing a melody, My Jesus, I love thee, you are beautiful. And, you know, before they sing, I'd like you to bow your heads as I pray. Our Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to be able to share and to show people the light from your word. But, Father, I pray especially for the Holy Spirit to be with Mike as he speaks and with Jenny and Kevin as they sing because each will draw us closer to you. And I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Just my pardon of 
Thank you, Kevin and Jenny. That was so touching, wasn't it? Absolutely beautiful. Um, it's a lovely prayer to music. Touched my heart. Folks, I'm talking today about Jesus, the light of the world. And that's what that song was about. And it was a beautiful introduction to what I want to say today. First of all, a thought. Um, in the world today, we're seeing some very amazing things happen. And some of them are very disturbing, as we know. Um, just recently, Nancy Pelosi, who was the Speaker of the House of Reps in America, made a trip to Taiwan, which upset China very, very much indeed. Um, plenty of Americans visit Taiwan. Why did this upset China so much? Because of whom she represents, folks. Um, she's the third in line after the Vice President to the President's position in an emergency which is fascinating to me because that means that she in a very, very direct way represents the American people. And that was why it was so important to China. Similarly, although not exactly, of course, Jesus came to this earth to represent the Father, God the Father. Um, and it's interesting, while Nancy Pelosi represented the president of probably the most powerful position in the world, um, God the father whom Jesus represented was the representation of the most powerful position in the entire universe, folks. Uh, he was the creator, or is the creator, the almighty. And Jesus came to represent him. And the fascinating thing is that he came to represent him in his humanity. Jesus in his humanity was to represent the father. How was he to do this? Now, I'm going to refer to a scripture here, which I think is very helpful uh, in this context. John chapter 14. And we're going to show it on the screen for you. And I'm looking at John chapter 14. And first of all, verse 7. John 14 and verse 7. And this is Jesus talking to his disciples. And he says to them, If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. And this confused the disciples. And so Philip speaks up and he says in verse eight, Lord, show us the father and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus makes this statement. And this one is also on the screen for you. Have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the father. He who has seen me. This is a deep and profound statement 
that if we have seen Jesus, we know what God the Father is like. Um, this astounds me. Going on into verse 11, Jesus continues and he says, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Now, this is very interesting. So the things that Jesus did, his works, were going to demonstrate to the world and to us, of course, what the Father is like. So what is the Father like? Well, once again, I'm going into the scripture here. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 4 this time. Matthew chapter 4, I'm going to read verse 23 and verse 24. And uh, this is what it says about Jesus. Early in his ministry now, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. And his healings were of such an extent that his fame, it says in the next verse, went out throughout all Syria. And they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases. Folks, there was nothing, no disease that he could not deal with. Diseases, torments, those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him, and no wonder that this was the case. Um, it's amazing to me the things that Jesus did. One of the things that I think reveals who Jesus, sorry, who the Father was so clearly is in uh, Matthew chapter 8. I'm going to read a few verses there, starting at verse 2 this time. A great multitude had surrounded Jesus on this occasion. And on verse 2 it says, And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. This was a very interesting statement, wasn't it? If you were willing. This is, a, this is a man who is totally confident that Jesus has the power to do the thing that he asks him to do if he's willing. So what does Jesus reply? And remember, Jesus is speaking for the Father here. This is what Jesus said. Jesus put out his hand, touched him and said, I am willing. Be cleansed. Immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. Now, a leper is a person who's dying while alive. And if you've ever seen a leper, um, it's a tragic thing. I have seen them and some of you will have done. And uh, we all know what tremendous need these people are in. Uh, he was cleansed immediately. What a beautiful thing to have seen that and to see the look on the man's face. What is this telling us about God the Father? God wants to heal his people, folks. He wants to touch our lives. He wants to, to prosper us and bless us. And we need to keep that in mind. God is not reticent to help his people. God is willing. Jesus said so right here. This is what the Father is like. Look at his acts of compassion now, his acts of restoration of people. The best of those well-known stories is in John chapter 8 and the story of the woman taken in adultery. And without going into the details here, I just want to pick up on the main points of this quite amazing story. In chapter 8 of John, verse 3, it says, The scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and they set her in the midst, this poor woman. And Jesus says nothing. He just writes some very telling things in the sand at the feet of the crowd. They look, they read, and they leave quickly. And Jesus raised himself up from writing on the sand and said to her, he saw no one but the woman and said, woman, where are those who accused you? Has no one condemned you? And she says, no one, Lord. Then he says this, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus wasn't making light of sin here, folks. He was just extending mercy to this woman and restoring her life. This was the beginning of a new life for her because God had done such a wonderful thing. That is what the Father is like. That's the point that we are making today. This is what he's like. Here's another interesting thing that happened. Jesus has 5,000 people, that is 5,000 men, plus women and children, 
listening to him in an outdoor setting and they've got nothing to eat and the time goes by and they're in trouble. And I want to refer to it in Mark chapter 6. And I'm going to read here from verse, let's see, verse um, 7. Mark chapter 6 and verse 7. No, I'm on the wrong spot here. Um, 37. Make that 37. Folks, that story touched me so much. I had tears in my eyes. Couldn't read. Verse 37. Jesus said, when the disciples pointed out that the people had been a long time without food, Jesus said to them, you give them something to eat. But one of them said, well, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat. Now that's 200 days wages, the equivalent thereof. So in today's terms, that's got to be at least, say, $25,000 at least, hasn't it? So they're saying, we would, with $25,000, we couldn't buy enough food for all these people. So Jesus said, go and see what you do have. So they go off and they come back and they say, five, five loaves, these are small loaves, we'd call them buns today, five loaves and two fish. And uh, Jesus tells them to set the people down in order. And so they do that. Now, just think about how many people there are here. 5,000 men besides women and children. Now, I'm sure a conservative, a conservative estimate here would be about 15,000 people. And let's say they eat two buns and two fish each. That's 30,000 buns and 30,000 fish. Now, look, folks, a semi-trailer will be lucky to carry all that food. Why such an extravagant demonstration of the power of God? Because that's what God is doing all the time. He's feeding the entire world, in fact, the entire universe. He is feeding them. And so this was to be a massive demonstration of what the Father is like. And so he feeds all these people. And it must have taken some time. And they're all watching as the food just keeps coming out of that basket. And uh, they bring about the great big loads and trays of food to all the people. And I'm thinking, what an amazing and wonderful demonstration of the power of God and the love of the Father. Not too many of us here have gone without. You're still here. That's a good sign. God provides for us all remarkably. And that is what Jesus was demonstrating. God the Father is exceedingly generous. So generous, in fact, there was more food than they needed. And remember, they collected what was left over. A big pile of food was left over. So they all had as much as they could eat. I'm impressed, aren't you? There's no possibility that Jesus could have had a few, you know, big, but his disciples bring a few baskets. And this is the point. They couldn't have brought a few baskets of food along on the sly so they could slip that out. No, they needed a semi-trailer load of food to feed all these people. There was to be no question. And I think at that point about the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Remember how the story went? Jesus heard that Lazarus was really sick and dying, but he stayed where he was, way up in the north of Israel, and didn't come down immediately. Finally, word came through that Lazarus had dead, was dead, and Jesus and his disciples then headed back to where Jesus, where Lazarus lived. Now, by the time they got there, it had been four days since he'd been put in the tomb. And Jesus and all the people gather around to see what Jesus will do. And Jesus is there comforting the two sisters, Mary and Martha of Lazarus. And uh, then he tells them to roll away the stone from the tomb. Now, Martha, ever the practical one, says, oh, Lord, don't do that. It's been four days by now. He stinks and there'll be a terrible smell. Jesus says, roll away the door, the, the, the stone. So they do. Why did Jesus wait so long? Why did he wait for the body of Lazarus to decay? Because this was to demonstrate the power of God to raise the dead. And if they've been dead for a thousand years, folks have all lost loved ones. How wonderful to know that God is not phased by our mouldering remains. So he calls Lazarus out of the tomb. No way that could be a trick. And that was very important because Jesus' enemies would be quick to try and make out that it was. 
but they couldn't do anything at this point. This is what Jesus did to demonstrate what the Father is like. The Father wants and will raise his children from the grave. I think of Jesus' life. Look at, think about his attitude to Judas, the man who would betray him. See him kneeling before the feet of Judas and washing his dirty feet. His eyes pleading with Judas to repent of what he knew he was about to do. But I'm afraid it was Judas was too determined. Look at him reasoning with Pilate. And Pilate basically says to Jesus, well, what, what, are you, what are you about? And he said, I came to bear witness to the truth. Remember Pilate's cynical response, what is truth? It was his defining moment, but he didn't pick up on it tragically. Um, but see him trying to help all he could because this is what the father is like. Jesus came to demonstrate that. It's worth pointing out there is such a thing as justice also, isn't there? Um, in fact, we're all interested in justice. We all want justice to be done. Let's face it. In our lives and everywhere where we see injustice, it, it incenses us. We want to deal with that. Well, God is going to deal with that and he is God of justice. Jesus proved that there was and showed that there was a line drawn. In fact, there's an interesting statement by Ellen G. White here. I need to read it because it's very helpful. It's in, from the book Christ's Object Lessons, page 177, 178. And this is what it says. Because of his long forbearance, men have trampled upon his authority. Now listen to this. But there is a line beyond which they cannot pass. And I think that's encouraging to know. There is a lot of wickedness. Yes, there's goodness in the world. But there's a lot of wickedness out there as well. But there's a line beyond which humanity cannot pass without there being consequences. And I'm glad about that. Um, did Jesus demonstrate that part of God? Yes, he did. Um, there's a very interesting statement that he made. More than one, actually. He, uh, he warned against offending children. Remember that one? Very seriously. Better for a millstone hung around your neck and thrown into the sea, he said, than to offend a child. And uh, he also had some serious things to say to some other people. And I'm thinking particularly here of the Pharisees. There's one thing that Jesus got very incensed about people, and that was hypocrisy. To say one thing and be another. That's what it means to be a hypocrite. Um, Jesus was very unhappy about that. In Matthew 23 and uh, verse 30, let's see, 30, 29, 29, verse 29, Jesus is talking and his, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. There's that word. Because you build the tombs of the prophets, adorn the monuments of the righteous, and say, if we had lived in those days, we wouldn't have done that. Verse 31, Therefore you are witnesses against yourself that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. So these were strong words. Serpents, brood of vipers. Why did he speak so strongly to these people? Because not only did they need to know exactly what was going on in their lives, but we needed to know. And uh, a lot of what he, he said is not just for the benefit of those listening at the time. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Now, the word hell that's used there is the word Gehenna, um, which is um, a, a, pl a place of the dead, an uncomfortable place of the dead. Um, but he said, th this is a strong condemnation of that attitude. So, yes, there is such a thing as justice. There is a judgment. And we need a saviour all the more because of that, don't we? Moving along. What was the ultimate demonstration of what God the Father is like? Well, of course, it was the cross. When Jesus gave his life for us, um, that was the ultimate demonstration of the mercy of God and the justice of God. Mercy for the human race was provided by Jesus' death and justice in dealing with the sin of the human race, which Jesus himself carried to his death on that cross. So it was amazing how God... In, in Jesus' life, demonstrated what he was like in his works and how beautiful that was. Now, Jesus didn't stay in the tomb. Here's the beauty of the whole story. 
He was resurrected. And according to the scriptures, that resurrection was a vital part of his mission to the earth. And he was resurrected, A, to show that his mission had been successful and was accepted by the Father, and B, to demonstrate that he has the power to raise the dead and to raise you and me. He has the right to, be ra to raise the dead because he himself came forth from the tomb. Now, Jesus' resurrection was a lot different from the resurrection of Lazarus. Lazarus was a helpless corpse. Jesus was not. And here's the remarkable thing. I'd like to turn to John 10. John chapter 10, and I'm going to read there verse 17. John 10, verse 17. Listen to this remarkable statement. Therefore, my father lays, loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Now, this one is on the screen for you. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. Jesus himself came from the tomb with the power that was within himself. And you say, how can that be? Because Jesus was not only man, he was God. He was the God man. And if that isn't a mystery to you, then you've got more understanding than myself and everybody else I know. Folks, this is a mystery. And how beautiful though, that Jesus was able to come down, come out of the tomb like that. And in chapter 11, just as he continues on, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection. That is deeper than just having the power to raise the dead, isn't it? He was, he was the resurrection. He was the life. And he was the light of the world. Um, incredible. So I ask again, what sort of person did the Son of God, the Jesus himself, have to be in order to represent the Father in the way that we have seen him do? Folks, it has to be someone, in essence, the same as the Father. That's the important point. Not the same person, but in essence, the same as God himself. And it's very interesting, isn't it, that in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, Isaiah 9, 6, in an amazing prophecy that Isaiah gave about the coming Messiah, Jesus, he makes this description of him in verse 6, Unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. And it's interesting to me that that is the title given to Jesus here. Not the same person, yes, we understand that, but in essence, the same as the Father, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It's made very clear there, indeed, whom we're talking about. Now, we have a saying that all good things come to an end. And Jesus' visible presence, the visible demonstration or the presence of the God the Father was to be taken from the earth after 33 and a half years. Um, Jesus warned his disciples this was coming. They were devastated. I'm going to read the story in John chapter 16. And I'm going to read verse 13 there. And this is what Jesus says. However, when he, sorry, the spirit of truth will come, he will guide you into all truth. Now he's talking about the one who will replace him here um, because he was not to stay with them forever. Um, John chapter 16, um, verse 5, perhaps to begin with, but uh, this is the verse I was after, sorry there. But now I go away to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Understandable. Dear friends, they had been with the light of the world. And when he tells them that they, he's going away, they begin to think, oh no, back to the plough, back to the tax booth, back to the kitchen. How can I do this after what we have seen and experienced for three and a half years? Um, but Jesus has gotten good news for them. He says what I just read there, and well, I'm going to read in verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. How could this be? If I do not go away, he says, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. If I depart. So he says it's to your advantage. 
you are going to be better off, he says, when I go away. And uh, while they found that very hard to understand, they were soon to learn what he meant by that. And uh, we started reading in chapter 16. Actually, I'd like to go back to chapter 14, just a page back in my Bible. Chapter 14, verse 16, where Jesus says, I will pray to the Father and he will give you another helper, it says in the New King James, um, the paraclete, one who is called alongside to help, the comforter, the Holy Spirit. I love the word comforter here. That he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. And then he goes on to say in verse 18, the next verse, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. What is he saying to us here? Um, dear friends, he's in the same breath talking about the Spirit coming. He talks about himself being with them. It is through the Spirit, through the Comforter, that Jesus dwells with each of his children wherever they are throughout this great world, this, in, this entire globe. The millions of people here through the Spirit, he can be with each one at any time. And I just think what an amazing miracle. Are we grateful for the Comforter? We are. Even if Jesus had lived to be a hundred, it wouldn't have made any difference to you and me today. We needed and we need the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And he brings Jesus into our lives. Um, and I'm so grateful that he does that. There's an interesting statement also, Bell and G. White, here from the book Mount of Blessings, page 85 here. And it makes this statement, as we make Christ our daily companion, and it is our privilege by faith to have his presence through the Spirit, the Comforter, continuously. As we make Christ our daily companion, we shall feel that the powers of an unseen world are all around us. And by looking unto Jesus, we shall become assimilated to his image. By beholding, we become changed. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that this is an experience that too many of us are not having. And I'd like to talk about what we might do about that in just a moment's time. A beautiful thought. In chapter 14 of John, I'm still there, verse um, 21, Jesus says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Of course. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And then I want you to notice this. And I will love him and manifest myself to him or her, of course. Now, this is really interesting. Manifest, that is reveal. He will reveal himself to you. How does he do that? I read this verse for a long time and pondered over it. What does he mean that he will manifest him, reveal himself to me? How, he, how will I know that he is doing that? And then, Lord, if you read on, you'll notice that Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. Peace I give unto you. Dear friends, if we take time to be quiet before him, we will know the peace of his presence. That's how you will know that he is with you. And I think it's a beautiful promise that he's given us. Chapter 16, going on. Um, verse 23, Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he'll keep my words. My father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home. Old King James says, make our abode with him. That's an interesting promise, isn't it? It's a beautiful promise. They will come to us. Here again is an experience that we may all have, dear friends. We may have the presence of Jesus with us all the time. We encourage our children, don't we? Ask Jesus into your heart. This is what we are talking about here, having Jesus in your heart, Jesus in your life. And it's the Holy Spirit who does this. People, we are living in the age, the time of the comforter, the time of the Holy Spirit. And when he comes into your life, he comes with all the attributes of Jesus who had come already with all the attributes of the Father. So we have Jesus and the Father, if you like, in the person of the Holy Spirit. No wonder it's so clear that the, per the Holy Spirit himself must be a person. And by the way, just for those who may be struggling as to whether the Holy Spirit has personhood, I want to just refer you to an interesting scripture 
that I think helps us in this respect. It's in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. I'm mentioning this because this point is so important. Um, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. And here the Apostle Paul is listing for us the fruit of the Spirit. And it's Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. Previous to that, by the way, he had given the fruit of the evil one. Not a very pleasant list. Uh, Verse 19, 20 and 21. Then he says, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such there is no law. This is beautiful, isn't it? This is actually a description of holiness. This is what holiness is like. This is what the Father is like. I want you to notice the first three of those fruit of the Spirit. Verse 22, love, joy, peace. They're kind of different from the rest of the list. The rest of the list deals with characteristics of the character, personal characteristics of what God wants to make us like. But the love, joy and peace are an experience that is ours to have. We are to have the experience of love, joy and peace from God. And I'm going to suggest to you that if you find your life a little lacking in those things, that you claim this this is a promise and say, Lord, this is what you have said you will do in my life. Give me that love, joy and peace. And also these other beautiful things, long-suffering kindness. You know, what is the most um, important characteristics of a man? Do you know what the scripture says? Kindness. Good one to pass on to young men are getting married, isn't it? What is the most important characteristics for a young man? Kindness. Kind of covers everything, doesn't it, when you think about it? And I think it's a lovely, a lovely thought. So love, joy and peace. It's yours to experience and you can claim that promise and ask for it. I'm so glad that God makes it so clear to to us. And by the way, are these the attributes of a person or a power? Well, clearly, these are the attributes of a person. Long-suffering, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. I mean, these are the characteristics of a person. The Holy Spirit, dear friends, in order to give us those characteristics, must have them himself and be a person in the fullest sense of the word, the word. And God wants to to share those attributes with his children in order that we might share the benefits of those attributes with a very needy world around us who need to have those kind of characteristics demonstrated to them and even given to them and shared with them. What a beautiful picture. Now, the story goes on in the book of Acts and it takes us into the into the region of Samaria. Now, the Samaritans were kind of partly Jewish and partly other nationalities and not always appreciated by the Jews. And by the way, the the feeling was mutual. And Jesus, however, did some ministry there and a lot of the the Samaritans came to accept Jesus as their saviour, which was a really interesting thing. Anyhow, if you turn with me to Romans chapter 8, I'm going to read one particular story um, which throws a lot of light on the Holy Spirit for us here in an interesting kind of a way. So we're in Acts chapter 8. Verse 5 says, It was Philip who went down to the city of Samaria, Samaria, Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip. They responded, which is amazing considering, don't forget, they didn't like the Jews. And yet they responded to Philip, a Jewish man, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Now, I want you to get that. People who were filled with the Spirit now, as Philip was, had that power to perform miracles and and heal the sick. Um, the demonstration of the Father was continuing in the humble, defective lives of the, of the disciples even. Um, anyhow, they, they were deeply impressed. And verse 8 says, there was great joy in the city. 
And there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery. So he, he was into witchcraft. Practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great. So basically he used his, his powers, his powers of sorcery to build himself up in the eyes of the people. And the people were impressed, all right, with the things that he did. Verse 10 says, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest. Everybody was impressed by this man. And they said, this man is the great power of God. He liked that. Anyhow, so along comes Philip and he preaches. And uh, verse um, 13 says, Simon himself also believed. So Simon the sorcerer accepts Jesus as his saviour. And it says he was baptised and he stayed with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and the signs which were done. So he stayed there and he was continued, continued to be quite astounded by all that was going on and very impressed. And so he, can, he hatched an idea, a plan. Um, and this is what the plan was. Um, he watched the people being baptised. And of course, as I said, he was. We read he was. Verse 17 says, Then the apostles laid hands on the people who were baptised and they received the Holy Spirit. Now Simon is really interested. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. What was the, the chief mistake, apart from the obvious one of the money and thinking he could buy this power? What was the obvious mistake that he was making? He saw the Holy Spirit, dear friends, as a power alone. He did not see the personhood of the Holy Spirit at all. And so he said, verse 19, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter had some strong words to say to him. Look at this, next verse 20. Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter. Your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thoughts of your hearts may be forgiven you. Well, give him his due. Simon did repent. <laughs> Scared the life out of him when Peter said that. And uh, he uh, goes on to say, Peter that is, I see you are spoiled by bitterness and iniquity. And Simon says in verse 24, pray to the Lord for me. This really made him panic struck that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. He made the clear mistake, dear friends, of believing that the Spirit was a power you could buy and have, and then it was yours to use. Dear friends, you might be able to use a power, but you cannot use a person. The person uses us, who are willing to be used, of course. So, you cannot buy the person of God, but you may have the person of God, and this is the miracle of the Christian experience, that through the Holy Spirit, God will dwell within his children. And that is a miracle. That is why our lives can change. What hope could you offer the addict who lives under the bridge, dear friends, if you couldn't offer him the hope of a transformed life? And this is where the Holy Spirit's power comes in, that he is able to do that. He is able to transform us and make us new people. And like that woman taken in adultery, we're able to have a new start on life. The past is gone. And people, we often beat ourselves up over the mistakes we have made in the past. But if we have asked for forgiveness and we have made things right to the best of our ability, we have the privilege of moving on. Being forgiven, move on and have a new start. I'm very glad it's like that. Take it from me. We certainly need the Holy Spirit to come into our lives, to comfort us, to encourage us, to transform us and to empower us because God wants to do things through you and me that he has done through Jesus and through, and through his apostles and others who believed. No, we don't see the dramatic and the most the miraculous at this time, but there is a time coming 
when the people of God will be filled with the Holy Spirit and will receive the power that we, dis- that we saw described on the day of Pentecost and following that. There is a time coming. We need an infilling of the Holy Spirit at this time that most people do not have. It is a promise, the Holy Spirit, that we may have as we ask for him. And I would like to suggest that we take that very, very seriously. What is required of us is a surrender. Now, the word surrender is an interesting word. Some people find this just a little awkward to think about. Surrendering your life. Um, You know, you, you get the impression of an army or a person surrendering, don't you, to the enemy. Well, isn't it an interesting thing that the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 10, that when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the the death of his son. Dear friends, we are enemies of God until we surrender our lives to him. If you've made that surrender, keep doing that. I think it's a daily thing. Every day is a new start to your life. And at the beginning of the day, I'd encourage you, dear friends, to surrender your life to God. Surrender your life and receive Jesus through the Spirit and ask for the Spirit to change you and to make you the kind of person that he wants you to be. Um, Alone, dear friends, we have no spiritual power. We can do nothing for God and we are nothing. But with his Spirit, we are able to do amazing things. So here are some suggestions in concluding. When you wake in the morning, pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to come and fill you. The miracle is that he is able to control our thoughts when we cannot. And I'd invite you to do that. Surrender your mind and heart to God and ask for the Holy Spirit to fill you. Pray for the Comforter. And I want to encourage you to do something that too few of us do myself included. We're just so busy, aren't we? You ought to retire and see what happens to your life. There's just no spare time. And I'd like to read an amazing statement about the importance of taking the time to be quiet before God in prayer. This is the, this is the statement by Ellen White from the book Desire of Ages, page 363. It's a beautiful statement. When every other voice is hushed and in quietness we wait before him, the silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. Now, in my role as a pastor, I've talked to a lot of people about their relationship with God. There are a lot of people who have never heard God's voice. There are a few people like myself who have heard his voice on occasion. And I have run into a number of people who hear God's voice often. What makes the difference? Now, it is true that God does relate to us all differently. We're individuals and he meets our needs as they are. Why is it, though, that some people hear his voice? And it's an interesting thing. Um, More women than men have that experience. Um, Yes, it's true that women are generally more relational than men and perhaps that's it. I don't know. But I am very convinced, dear friends, that God speaks to us far more often than we hear. Remember, he speaks in a still small voice. And it's too easy to be too busy to hear that voice. And like I said, I believe God speaks to us all far more often than we hear. I'd encourage you to take time to wait before him and to hear his voice if he wants to share something with you that you need to know. Wait before him in quiet. That's something I'd like to encourage us to do. Another thing I'd like to encourage everyone to do is to take a a set aside days for prayer. Some of you have heard me talk about this. Um, Anne and I, my wife and I, spend most Fridays, we take them apart for prayer. There are some days it doesn't happen, but most Fridays we do. And we pray every hour on the hour. We don't stay home all day. Uh, We go off doing all the things that we would normally do. But every hour on the hour, each of us knows the other one is praying. And we have a list of things and people mostly that we pray about and for. And um, it's a very, very wonderful thing. And the reason we do it on Friday is so that we can rest in God's grace 
on Sabbath. It doesn't mean we don't pray on Sabbath, but what it means is that we have committed everything to God in prayer and now we're just resting in his ability to meet the needs that we have prepared and presented before him. So I'd encourage you to do that. Um, we wasn't, that wasn't um, an idea that we had um, ourselves to begin with. Um, there's a, a couple down in um, Glen Hewen, down the south of Hobart in Tasmania, and they began praying for their boys, and they told me about this. And uh, they said, we, we set aside every Friday to pray for our boys. I thought, well, that's a wonderful idea. That was years ago. And so we have been doing it ever since. Thanks, Bill and Deidre, if you're watching this program. It's a wonderful thing to do, and I'd encourage us all to think about that. Remember we read back there that Jesus said that if we are obedient and faithful to him, he will manifest himself to us. I think it's in those quiet moments as we listen for God to speak that he will reveal himself and his peace will settle upon us. Here are some experiences that we don't experience often enough. I want Jesus to turn on such a light in our souls, dear friends, that we become truly a light of the world as the light of the world, Jesus, dwells within us. I'd like to pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the amazing promises that you have given us. Thank you for the promise of the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, who comes with no modified energy, but comes to reach into our hearts and minds, our innermost person to touch our lives, to transform our lives and to bring Jesus to us. I pray that both the Holy Spirit and Jesus and, your, and the Father will come and make his abode with each one of us who are sharing in this program today. I thank you for the moving of your Holy Spirit today. And I thank you for the wonderful promises of the, Spirit, of the Scripture. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 